Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, of course. Welcome to the second day of our spring gathering. Um, very nice to hear, to see all these happy faces already after the exchange yesterday. Uh, today we also have a great, great program. And uh, we have again our panels in the mornings uh, with the panel, the first panel being on international relations and foreign policy and feminist foreign policy. And the second panel is more about multinational companies. And uh, afterwards, after the lunch, we will have a great workshop uh, with Chiara um, on how to mentor your mentor. And after the wrap up, like yesterday, you will have again the opportunity to be a model, to be photo shooted by Ole, and to become some professional picture for, for anything you need. Great, um, so then let me introduce our moderator today, Domiziana Francescon, uh, she is Director for Partnerships. Domiziana, having a background in digital media studies as well as publishing studies, um, she oversees now the Elsevier Foundation's partnerships and programs that support inclusive health and research and effectively align to the key science, health and technology challenges as outlined in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Domitiana, please. Thank you. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Please. Oh, come join me. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to be there for. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so hi, hi, good morning, everyone. It's so nice to be here. I think sorry for such a nice introduction. Um, and so indeed, hi, my name is Domiziana. As Zarifa said, I work at the Elsevier Foundation, which is a corporate nonprofit funded by the scientific publisher Elsevier. And indeed, we look um, at partnerships uh, supporting the development goals, especially looking at inclusivity in science and research. Uh, for example, we work in Indonesia with um, individuals living with HIV. We support awards for women in science in the global south. Uh, we work in the US with communities of Latino communities living with diabetes and so on. Um, and we're just very, very lucky that this is the second year that we've been um, able to support this Fall Involves um, Female Science Talent Program and, you know, just being uh, guided by Zarifa and her team. And it's just really, really such a pleasure to be here with you. Um, and it's even more of a pleasure that I get to kickstart uh, this second day and to have the, um, the honor really to, um, to chat with uh, Salmin Chalishkan, trying to pronounce that as best I can, uh, so which did. I'm really, <laughs> really excited. Um, and, you know, just I'm um, kind of saying a few words about your bio, but I'm sure we'll hear more about your work a little bit later. Um, so, uh, Ms. Charles Khan has been the Director of International of Institutional Relations at the Open Society Foundation since 2019. Um, before that, um, she was the Secretary General of the German Section of Amnesty International, uh, working especially on refugee and asylum policy. She's also worked for Medica Mundial, um, leading the advocacy of women's rights activists in Afghanistan, in the Kosovo, DRC, Libya, um, and so on. Um, and of course, uh, in the course of, of her career, she's also been part of the advisory board of the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, um, so working to promote the public discourse around feminism and policy, um, advising politicians and ministries, and, and really develop a more just feminist foreign policy. Uh, so you, you can see why I'm really excited to talk with her. Uh, really, this is just <laughs> fantastic. And before we start, just one last thing. We want this to be a dialogue, right? You know, this is also about you and, and for you. So we'll stop and pause at different moments in this conversation. So get your comments and your questions uh, so that we can make this really, really interactive. Um, and yeah, thank you so much again for being here. And thank you for joining us. Thank you, Domitiana. Of course. So, um, you know, uh, as we mentioned, your career has spanned so many super interesting polit um, topics and, and there are so many questions I want to ask you. But since uh, the panel, uh, really the title is on feminist foreign policy, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how you got first started to think about feminist foreign policy uh, and what your involvement has been uh, mm -hmm. with the topic. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Domitiana, and uh, also Zarifa for uh, accompanying and uh, inviting me. Uh, it's it's a great pleasure to talk to you, and uh, I think it's already um, part of feminist foreign policy what we are doing here together today. And 
Um, so, uh, where to start? Okay, uh, I'm 56 years old, so where shall I start? Uh, I can start uh, with the age of 21. Okay, uh, I was part I had the, the great luck to be part uh, of, of a feminist uh, organization in Bonn at that time. And in those times, uh, the peace movement in, in Germany came up in the 70s and 80s um, to fight against uh, the, competi the, the armament competition between Russia and the West. It, it's called NATO Doppelbeschluss. It's a double track uh, uh, resolution uh, which was done by NATO at that time. And, it, and, it could mo and this, this fear of, of uh, nuclear war uh, mobilized many, many people and also influenced uh, people who were working in different projects uh, in, in Germany. Um, I, uh, I was part with 21. I was at that time already a mother. Uh, I got uh, my daughter very early with 20. And then uh, I joined a feminist organization to work with, uh, with migrant women. Right. And I, I had the luck that uh, this feminist organization uh, was uh, brought up by uh, women from the German peace movement. And I was at that time uh, uh, a migrant girl uh, coming from a guest worker, Turkish family, Turkish Muslim family in, in Germany from the working class. And uh, I had the luck uh, that the solidarity and also the perspectives on, on migrants' uh, lives in Germany were changing already in the 80s, so that they took me on board. And uh, I, I became part uh, of, uh, we occupied uh, the office in Bonn of the biggest trade union in Germany, of the DGB, um, in order to call uh, for mobilization against the first Gulf War. And I was 21, I took my two years uh, with me, and we were sleeping day and night, uh, three weeks in that office. Uh, they did not uh, throw us out as DGB because that could uh, damage harm to their image. And uh, I remember that Gregor Gysi, at that time, um, the, the leader of the, of the left party in Germany, came with his big black car and was offering us a, a big speech on, on a demonstration against the Gulf War in Bonn with more than half a million people. So, and we were all feminist women, predominantly white German feminist women. And um, why I am talking about that? Because one of the misconceptions is that feminist uh, foreign policy is only focused on making uh, the lives and the participation, the representation and the resources for, for uh, feminists better in, uh, globally in, in every system. And uh, that is wrong. We as women, we stood up and called for a general strike because we were as women, as feminist women, against war. And that, that, that was my first uh, experience, the occupation of uh, three weeks of, of this office. So we confiscated a fax machine, telephone, at that time no handies, uh, of the secretary general and sent him home. And then the media were uh, <laughs> continued coming and we had a big coverage of that. And we were very successful in, in, um, in uh, announcing uh, what, what we were asking uh, fr from our German government at that time. Yeah. Absolutely. That is, that is a great story. I love it. You, you bringing your, your daughter. You should to have the seen the face of the Secretary General when we were confiscating his office. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, deal with it. Yeah. Can you <laughs> and so, and so how, how did you move from, from that moment at yeah. 21, occupying a big office yeah. building against the Gulf Ward? To, to working to shape the framework of, of feminist mm. policy? How did that? Okay, the, these uh, 10, 12 years in between were um, covered by being a social worker for, for predominantly uh, migrant women and black women in, in Germany. Um, and helping them uh, to, to get through the, the, the administration jungle in Germany. But also, I was also a, a German teacher giving a German class and uh, all my uh, pupils, uh, women from different countries, they loved to see me because for them I was a role model in terms of, oh, look at her, she speaks perfectly German and that means we can also reach that. It's very simple, it's so very simple. These small things are so 
they have so much impact. And then uh, I jumped on the international level by joining uh, Medica Mondial in, in Cologne. It's a Cologne-based feminist organization, and I was leading the, the advocacy policy and campaigning work for eight years there. And uh, that was also a big luck for me, because uh, at that time, in 2000, the UN Resolution uh, 1325 on uh, women, peace, and security was issued by the, uh, by the uh, Security Council. And uh, two years later, in Germany, we, f we, meaning again, again, feminist activists from different organizations uh, in Germany, also, uh, I would say at the top it was Heinrich Böll Foundation, the Green Party Foundation, which was resourcing us with money, but uh, different organizations from the peace and from the feminist movement uh, and also from... Um, uh, from uh, the humanitarian uh, work movement in Germany, uh, were part of the first Women's Security Council, we called it like that, uh, Frauensicherheitsrat. And this, this work in the council, it was a campaigning uh, network. Uh, we issued shadow reports uh, when Germany had to report to the UN about how they implement UN uh, resolution 1325, we collected uh, data and experiences from the ground, and I could, uh, I could contribute with all my experiences which I got uh, with women's uh, feminist uh, intersectional movements in Kosovo, Bosnia, Congo, uh, Liberia, and mainly Afghanistan. And that means also a lot of experiences from the ground found their way into these uh, alternative or call it shallow, shadow reports. And in the end, we got a national action plan in, in Germany. Now, more than 100 countries in the world have national action plans, which is super, but uh, mostly not implemented. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that sounds um, <laughs> we have much disheartening work to do. in some in some ways. But I can see, I can also see, like indeed, there is work, there is a plan. Yeah. We can do something. And there are so many things you just mentioned that I want to come back to. But I just wonder, um, just kind of wrap up this, this little first section, if you could just take us back a step and really just tell us a little bit more about when we talk about feminist foreign policy, what are the principles, what are the objectives? Mm. Could you give us a little bit of that framework? Um, and then I really want to talk about you know, intersectionality and representation mm. and, and that area. Okay, Germany now has uh, issued a feminist foreign policy approach on 80 pages. I don't know if you are aware of, you can find it on the uh, page of the Foreign Office. And it says uh, rights, uh, representation and resources for feminist movements around the world. And uh, mainstreamed, these uh, three R's are mainstreamed uh, by um, a mainstreaming of, of diversity so that the intersectional aspect uh, finds its way to each of these three R's. Um, I, I really liked it, uh, but still, uh, as, I, as I told you, we have many, many papers, we have so much resolutions, we have legally binding uh, conventions, and not much is happening uh, on the ground. And uh, nevertheless, nevertheless, uh, we have needed in Germany uh, a feminist uh, foreign minister. Mm. To, to have this, because before it was nearly impossible to get a meeting with one of the male foreign ministers to talk about <laughs> women, peace and security. Really, it was like that. I know that, because uh, I know it also from my leadership roles when I was trying to place that topic. I used my, my position at Amnesty, for instance, uh, to talk to foreign ministers and to, to take it on the agenda when they were meeting us on, on human rights violations. Uh, related to, to other topics than feminist foreign policy, but that was also a strategy of mine uh, to get it on the agenda so I can talk with it and later on I can, could give the results back to the network, uh, which is every day working on this topic but not able to get um, a meeting with the foreign minister. That is a very important strategy uh, also in terms of, uh, of solidarity uh, between uh, among us. It really is indeed, because I think you're touching on something that, that I was thinking about while you were speaking in terms of misconceptions, right? The idea that if we go and talk about feminist anything in a lot of circles, I think it's seen as a women's thing, yeah. you know, or whatever you do, your women's thing and feminism is not for us, it's not for everyone. But it is, like you said at the beginning, 
you were a group of feminists and you were campaigning against the war yeah. as feminists. And it is kind of indeed the idea of like, oh, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a minister, I'm a guy, I don't need to be talking with you about this. And I find that so, um, it's such a blind spot, mm -hmm. truly. And, and I also just wanted to come back with the fact that you just said, you know, we have reports, we have documents, we know what should be done. Things are not moving. Mm -hmm. Why? Do you have, what's happening? <laughs> I, I think uh, we are all everywhere where we live as, as women, as, as um, diverse women, we are still living in very patriarchal settings. It has not changed a lot. Uh, if, if you look at, um, if you look at, at, the, um, at the photos of, of the last Munich security conference, yeah. I'm not talking about the side events <laughs> where women in, in nice dresses are uh, also on, on these uh, pictures. I'm, I'm talking about uh, all these men, maybe with one woman, all white men, mm -hmm. uh, no diversity at all, and, uh, and the mindset is not uh, feminist foreign policy. The, the mindset of feminist foreign policy is deeply rooted in human security and not in the security of states. I think that that is uh, the one very, very important uh, dividing um, in terms of concepts. What does it mean? It means human security and it means uh, especially uh, the human rights, uh, which you need to have security, especially for, for marginalized uh, populations, for the LGBTI community, for Muslim community, for black community, for, um, for women in, in, uh, in, war, in post war uh, countries uh, who live under extreme poverty being traumatized, uh, being the, the only breadwinner in, in the family because the men are all dead or they are not, uh, you cannot uh, find them anymore. You don't know where they are, their, their whereabouts are unclear. And uh, that, that is the normal, I'm talking about the average women in, in post-war countries. So uh, at least, uh, for instance, in Liberia, um, there is a, um, there is said that at least 60% uh, of the women in, in the southeast of, of Liberia were raped during war. And uh, I think this, uh, this pain, uh, this pain of the women has led to a very strong uh, peace movement between Christian and Muslim women in, in Liberia. They are at the forefront of role models mm -hmm. how to influence peace negotiations. Uh, from an informal network, because normally women are not part of the of of, polit of the uh, of uh, polit uh, the po mm -hmm. politics and not of the military, which are uh, track one when it comes to to uh, peace negotiations. It's called track one, and women are on track three. But uh, I think uh, women's power and and women's intelligence and their own perspectives uh, on the violence which happens in war are super underestimated. If you look at Sudan, if you look at Afghanistan, uh, even now in Ukraine, um, we, we need to be loud on that. We need to be loud and decisive. And uh, I think also, for me, it's a compliment to be called a feminist. I'm an intersectional feminist. And uh, I would never, um, yeah, it's called the F word. Yeah, sorry, I am a feminist. <laughs> Everyone I'm else. proud of it. <laughs> yeah, as, you, as you should, as we should. I really. Yeah, but you. but you have also uh, in in foundations or in organizations where I worked, uh, I was the only feminist, nearly. Really? really? That is, do you think that's because it's still <laughs> such a such a word that I don't know, like you know, what are, what is a misconception there? What is what do you think it's was stopping your colleagues to say, yeah, sure, me too. Why shouldn't I be? Do you have? You know, ideas on why why that why that is why it's still so hard to be out there and say, yeah, I'm a feminist. Uh, um, <laughs> I know this is a very yeah, hard no, question. No, no, Domitiana, you're absolutely right. I I think. Uh, Okay, I can only talk about myself. Uh, I, I, I'm coming from a Turkish Muslim uh, wor working class family from the Black Sea er area in, in, in Turkey, second generation. And uh, for, I had the luck uh, to be in Germany and to make my decision. Mm -hmm. it, it has all a price. If, if you, I left my family yeah. with 16. I ran away because I don't want to, to, to live that what was foreseen for me. Uh, and I had also, again, I had the luck, uh, but I had also my, my, I don't know where it comes from, I have an inner power uh, to stand my ground and to, and to say uh, what I want and what I don't want in my life. And uh, it has a price, 
if you say it's okay that you leave your family and maybe your family doesn't want you back yeah. in, 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 the, in the form you are, uh, then you have to face it. It has a price. And uh, for me, it was okay to take that prize because uh, my role is, is not in the family. My role is outside. Uh, I, I want to give my strength uh, to uh, migrant people, black people, uh, women, LGBTI, disabled people, and uh, try to work together and, and do campaigning to make um, a more uh, just uh, context for them, living context for them. Yeah, and thank you so much. And, and I think this also brings us back to um, something that you've mentioned before, and I think it's worth exploring a little bit more in terms of <coughs> intersectionality, as you said, mm -hmm. intersectional feminists. And also, I, you, know, you know, I agree with you. Um, if we're not intersectional, we're just not doing the work. Um, everyone has obviously different identities, you know, which is, you know, from, um, you know, you're a woman, but you might also be part of another group, depending on where you're coming from, maybe LGBTI, whatever it is. It's it's really so important to acknowledge those intersections and, and understanding how to work within them. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit um, about how you've approached intersectionality in your work on feminist foreign policy and how those politics, uh, politics can really help kind of elevate and mm -hmm. un understand the voices of communities that are underrepresented mm -hmm. in any way. So I think uh, everybody who's sitting here is already somewhere. Uh, so, um, I think it depends on your own values and principle and if you want to see them uh, to be lived up also in the system you're working and, and living. And also a very simple thing is, uh, was for me when I was uh, in the uh, co-leadership of, of uh, Open Society Foundations in the Berlin office here, um, I, I was, I was, uh, um, I could, I was giving grants, so I had a very powerful uh, position uh, to shape. And uh, every event I was shaping, I was asking, is somebody there from Eastern Germany? What? Mm -hmm. Why mm -hmm. Eastern Germany? Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, is somebody? Is is a woman? Uh, is a woman there uh, from working class? Uh, do you have somebody disabled? Is a black person there? Uh, do you have somebody? Uh, who has just recently arrived in Germany as, as a human rights activist, for instance, uh, under asylum or under international protection. And uh, I think that that is very important to, to if you have this convening power uh, to bring people at the table which normally are not brought to the table, but whose perspectives and voices we need uh, for solutions, for global solutions on, on climate, on digitalization and the threats with, which it brings. Um, uh, and also on, on human rights and uh, social injustice. Social injustice is a 40 years trend. We have done a lot of foresight in, in our foundation and it was a clear trend that injustice will increase uh, in, in the next uh, 40 years. So it's a threat also to, to all uh, rule of law system, to democracy and also to human dignity. Yes, absolutely. And I don't know, that was a very simple thing, but uh, if you have this power to, to decide who is in your meeting and who not, and uh, sorry, you have to do an extra mile if you, wanted it, you want to make it intersectional, because uh, the argument you're hearing, no, we don't know a black uh, departmental lead for... Um, I'm, I'm not saying now the, the name of the, <laughs> of the uh, organization. And then... Uh, uh, I, they called me and were asking me. I gave them right away five names of, of POCs, BPOCs, who could take up that leadership position. But you have really to uh, to invest um, extra, extra phone calls, extra meetings. You have to walk these miles uh, to get to get the, to get it right. If you want that, I want that. So I do the extra miles, and I know it, it makes so much work. In, the, uh, in your everyday life, in our everyday uh, lives, but uh, for me it's very uh, important to do that. Oh, absolutely it is. And I also think, um, because I come from industry, it also speaks a lot about how we're used to move in an industry setting, and I can only speak for myself, of course, meaning that a lot of things has to happen very fast. Mm -hmm. You have a program, you have an activity, it has to happen tomorrow, mm -hmm. and then never 
culture really allows for that, you know, perhaps taking the extra phone call, the extra mm -hmm. email. And I think there is work to be done to kind of embed that mm -hmm. slowness in some ways and reflection into everything that we do and not just go with the easy, with the easy solution, which I, I think I agree with you. It's just detrimental really to the whole, to the whole structure yeah. in some ways. And um, Domitiana, if I may, um, uh, during my time at Medicam Mondial, it was really appalling for me. Um, uh, 12 women uh, from Bosnia, they wanted to testify um, at the International Criminal Court about being raped during the war. And uh, at that time I was working at the organization and uh, I could witness and I was part of, of a huge campaigning also uh, towards the International Criminal Court. And that was also an informal feminist organizing around the world that, that, we, uh, that we could get um, the office of, of at that uh, day's uh, pro chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Ocampo, uh, he could not work anymore because we flooded his office with phone calls and with emails because uh, rape has vanished, disappeared during the night from the indictment uh, list of Karacic. And we said, that cannot be. That cannot, we are talking about Bosnia, that cannot be. There were rape camps and uh, you are doing a plea bargaining and, and disappearing uh, th this uh, crime, uh, this uh, war crime. In the meanwhile, it has become a war crime, mm -hmm. rape. Before it was crimes against humanity, now it has become a war crime, but also only with the pressure of feminist organizing. So don't let us underestimate also informal uh, organizing. Uh, the informal organizing has led in Guatemala, in, um, in Aceh, uh, and also in, in other countries, like Liberia, which I mentioned already, in, uh, to the fact uh, that, that the peace negotiations could be, um, yeah, could be uh, influenced uh, by women and also their life perspectives so that their topics could get into the peace negotiations. Absolutely. Oh, that is that is really fascinating, and also reminds me of something that you mentioned um, when we were speaking before the panel around how so in so many of these contexts there's also a bigger question, well, a bigger issue of raci racism mm -hmm. that should be addressed. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, when we talk about programmatic work for different aid organizations, um, organizations of really any kind, there really has to be an understanding of what kind of lenses are we using to, to do this programmatic work? How do we really look and get address the problems? And really, I, I think you were talking um, indeed maybe about Kosovo or Afghanistan, we were talking before mm -hmm. um, around, yeah, the issue of race uh, was also, you know, very much a lens that needed to be addressed and was never really addressed. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you had any... Yeah, okay. it's not only race, it's also uh, your, your ethnic uh, yeah. belonging, it's, it's your uh, sexual orientation and identity, it's your religion or to be not religious. Um, it's, it's many, many things. It's uh, the, the skin of, uh, the color of your skin, um, uh, I, what, okay, what I experienced was at that time, because I am who I am, I was doing it already intersectionally, also the work which I had done for Medica Mondiale. And I was always asking uh, when I was uh, on the ground, uh, where are uh, migrant women, uh, where are um, Hazara women in Afghanistan <clears throat> and in Congo also, uh, I was asking uh, about uh, diversity. Mm -hmm. But I could do that because I'm, I was living up to it mm -hmm. myself. But uh, if uh, white feminists are coming from the West and, and uh, giving formats, having resources normally, uh, to give the place to, to, to organize in, in uh, the countries of the South, and you're not walking the talk yourself uh, in, in your own white mm -hmm. countries, uh, then, then you're not uh, credible. Why? So um, the, the... And you're also not really doing the interest of the people that you're supposed to be it's, helping, it's not right? Only, it's not only interest. Uh, they... they, um, they perceive you as, as yeah. ignorant and arrogant and uh, that's it. And then you cannot do what you want to do there. So you have to walk your talk also before you go somewhere and uh, make it more uh, equal also in terms of resources. What, what I have experienced is uh, when I went to Congo, it was more, okay, I don't know much about Congo. It was, uh, I was in Goma mm -hmm. uh, and, and trying to... Um, 
to uh, mobilize resources for uh, existing women organizations who have organized already among <laughs> themselves. So my place, I found my place more in giving the resources and asking them uh, what we should submit to the EU in terms of, uh, or to the UN in terms of uh, peace, um, uh, of the uh, peacemaker, uh, peace building department, and also w when it uh, comes to military intervention by the EU or civil in intervention, I was asking always the activists on the ground what would they want to see, because that was the part they, they cannot do. They, they were surviving every day, and I found my part in okay asking them what would be their policy recommendations, and uh, I perceived myself more as, as somebody who was um, mm -hmm. linking this gap this policy gap and, and bringing uh, the, the, the needs from the ground to the policy uh, making tables. Oh, absolutely. And, and I think it reminds me of, I was just recently having a conversation with um, an early career researcher who um, won um, one of our uh, Women in Science Awards that, that we give out every year. And um, she's from Peru and she's working with um, kind of uh, tribes in the, in the jungles of Peru and communities who are really, really outside of, of the main modes of science communications. And she was talking about kind of a similar concept of cultural humility in some ways that, you know, she's a scientist and she does her research and she works with uh, maternal care, I believe. And she was like, you know, I went uh, into these communities and I really wanted to bring my research to them. And it took me a moment to understand the way I was talking and the way that I thought they needed my help was mm -hmm. such an arrogant <laughs> way of looking yes. at things. And, you know, she's like, well, then, you know, now I'm working with the communities directly to understand what they want and what their needs are and how we can really talk about science and evidence-based um, healthcare within their framework. And, and I really liked that idea. And indeed, in some ways, I think it's such a basic idea, but it's a really good mm -hmm. reminder of, you know, not doing that kind of parachute. Like, I'm just going to come and help you, but really taking the time again and being a little bit, you know, removed mm -hmm. and say, well, I, how can I serve you mm. in some ways? Um, and I wonder if this might be maybe a good moment to stop for a second and see if we have any comments or questions yeah. or any notes from the audience. Don't be shy. I think this is a, a really, you know, we want this to be a dialogue. Um, so any, any hands? <laughs> I see couple over here. Yeah, Hi. thank you. Um, this has been really interesting and I just wanted to pick up on the last part we were talking about. It kind of sounds like um, we were talking about the importance of co-design processes and I wondered if you have any practical strategies that you use. Um, on in, which processes? Like for co-design, for um, asking about the needs of the people that uh -huh. you're serving and um, how you go about that kind of practically. You just go there or you invite them and then uh, you, you talk together what uh, really is needed and uh, you you have to try to to lay your own um, <laughs> to the side and then really to to listen actively what it really is what they want and and then uh, you have try to try to um, combine it with what you know already in terms of policy discourses or uh, upcoming uh, opportunity uh, policy opportunities like donor conferences they are super donor conferences. They are so important <laughs> to get at the table and to ask for money uh, for marginalized communities uh, and also for women in post-war, for instance. And uh, the best is when, when you can have them invited uh, before this conference happens. I don't know, is, is that, was that satisfying for you? Yeah, or? yeah, no, that's what I meant. Um, and I, it just, I guess if it's kind of um, marginalised or minority groups, if there's anything, any way you do that differently or if it's still just about having conversations mm. with them. Um, it is, yeah. for instance, in, in, um, it is uh, very interesting. Um, many communities have already their, their culturally grown own uh, practices. And if you can uh, somehow combine this for instance, uh, when, when Medica Mondiale was uh, in the first years in Liberia, in the southeast, uh, where n nobody is, uh, the women were talking about palaver huts. And then we said, OK, then for psychosocial support, uh, for um, working with, with the trauma after being raped or uh, being um, subjected to other, um, other forms of violence against women, 
um, then the women were suggesting that they wanted to have palaver huts. So we, we f tried to find the resources uh, and we trained the women to become also psychosocial counselors uh, at that. And uh, each woman uh, who had, we're talking about rural community, very poor women, which was subjected uh, to a lot of violence during the war and also after the war. And then uh, they went to this uh, palaver hut and whenever one woman was entering the palaver hut, it was seen by the community and the psychosocial counselor joined her um, a little bit later so that she could talk. So this space to talk uh, freely um, in a non-discriminatory -di um, way and also in a format is, is super important. Thank you. Nobody who has, uh, who has uh, undergone a, a lot of trauma can become easily an activist in the end. Some of them are, and y you, you can support this process if they want that. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, so I'm going to quote an example I got from a friend. He was living in Amsterdam and he was doing a course at the Sandberg, which is an art school. And the committee was looking for a professor in I don't know, new media technology, something like that. And then the professor, the board of professors says, oh, we need a person of color. And the students were like, no, we just want the best professor. The, the color of the skin doesn't matter at all to us. I mean, it's like, oh, I need a blonde person. You know, it sounds to me as silly as that. You know, mm -hmm. if we keep on looking at this, yeah, very weird, random, I would say, you know, kind of qualification. So they were like, no, we just want the best professor. Mm -hmm. We don't really care if it's black, you know, yellow or white or whatever. And at the end, they really were looking just for the skin. So I think it just, it can become mm -hmm. something that ideally, as I believe, as I think we all believe, is something extremely empowering and powerful and can bring a lot of innovation, it becomes discriminatory. And for example, I was asked to work for this biennial of women, and I said, no, because we keep on doing the same mistakes. You know, we keep on isolating ourselves, like as if in the bus there would be a place, you know, like, we keep on segregating people by it. So I wanted to know, like, I mean, it's an extreme example, but I, want, I wanted to know your feelings towards this. And if you faced, you mm -hmm. know, this answer, like, because I can also understand the reactions of the students, like, we don't care. And then the second point would be, how do you overcome, um, you know, like through your, yeah, kind of um, amazing international experience, how do you overcome the... Um, battle that women and the competition that women have amongst each other mm -hmm. as well because ideally you're fighting for bigger goals and it's clear and everybody mm -hmm. should support them but within smaller groups so to say when we are speaking of <laughs> down-to-earth yeah, yeah. reality in which we don't you know fight for women that you know in Africa or in some other countries or freedom in Turkey mm -hmm. you know I have a lot of friends that left Turkey yeah. very courageously as you how do you overcome competition mm -hmm. bringing people together for a bigger role and yeah I'm, I'm bringing it really down to earth so I apologize for this because we're speaking of you know human rights no, in this case no, no, but Chiara, I wanted super. to know your feelings yeah. thanks sorry it was too long so um, oh. you have somebody sitting here who is defending really women quota uh, and quota also for uh, BPOC people. For me, it's not uh, not an opposite to to uh, to say uh, we need a person of color on this job and uh, to have the right expertise at the same time. For me, it's not an, an, a contradiction to find somebody like that. So I think we need quota un unless. Uh, we will all have uh, really, we can live up uh, to, to human principles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights so that everybody is equal, but we are not living in, in such a world. So I really like uh, the idea, even the Christian Democrats have now, um, have now uh, implemented a, a women quota in their own conservative party after years of fights uh, and also uh, for executives and, and um, uh, mm -hmm. what is... Um, I, I forgot in, in the business, uh, not oh, the... Oh, like a C-suite. Yeah, mean. exactly. Yeah. Uh, they have also a quota now in, in Germany. Um, I don't like quotas, but uh, we still need it. So, and uh, if you look who is sitting on which posi leadership positions, it's not because of their qualification. Mm. Yeah, mostly. 
Yeah, <laughs> that would be my counter argument for the, for the one BPOC person, uh, and uh, it's, it's always the same argument. Yeah, but it ne needs to be uh, he or she needs to be have expertise. That should be what what should be counting. Yeah, you're right, but uh, sorry, are you sitting here because you have expertise? No, because you're male and white. And you have the right networks. I you're mean, coming from middle class. Maybe something to bring up. Yeah, yeah, no, no. But I'm, but I'm also quite uh, like you, mm -hmm. uh, outspoken on that. Uh, you have the networks. You're coming from middle or upper class. Uh, you were brought up uh, already in political organizations like trade unions, uh, like uh, uh, churches, like political parties. For instance, migrants don't have that normally from from the working class, like me. We don't have this. This background, so it's it's um, you need role models or mentors who take you by the hand and show you how the system is working and how you can get through it with your elbows. Uh, about the competition between uh, women, I'm uh, myself part of it. Unfortunately, you are automatically you're becoming part of it because um, the cake uh, is uh, the size of the cake is not becoming bigger. And my impression from the last years on these uh, tankers which I was leading was uh, that uh, the, the, the part of the cake which is foreseen for us, uh, white women, black women, women like me, um, is quite small. So not many of, uh, of us are foreseen for these leadership positions. And uh, I think, uh, yes, it is, um, it is difficult to see the bigger picture when your own bank account is, um, uh, is influenced uh, by, by these power structures. And uh, we are not talking uh, courageous and open enough about this. Uh, I think... Uh, my personal stand on that is uh, I have done also a lot of uh, personal development for myself, internal development, inner change stuff in the last years, because otherwise I would have gone crazy about the political uh, landscape. Um, so I have done a, done a lot of inner work and that makes uh, myself more generous and more supportive also of other women. Um, who are trying to, to get on leadership uh, positions, to see the bigger picture, uh, how you call it. Uh, and I think uh, that that is um, a very good resource also to become resilient uh, against patriarchal uh, white uh, politics. Yeah, and if I can just, I, I know we have a question because I, I saw you before. I just want to mention that I think uh, also to what you just said, I think it's also important to be aware of where that, that competition is coming from, meaning who is telling you that you should be competing with all the women in the room? It's usually men. It's something Who is informal. pitting, exactly, oh, who is pitting yeah. women against women? And why is that? And yeah. why that might not be the same with men? So I like what you just said about also doing that kind of inner work and kind of as I'm examining a little bit where, and I'm speaking for myself, where is my feeling of competition? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be much better, would it be easier to instead try to lift each other up? And I know this is a very you know, general uh, way of talking and might be very aspirational, but I, I do think there is a lot of work to be done there and can be quite rewarding, I think, again, very personally speaking. Mm -hmm. but sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. I saw you had a question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would like to add a bit of another layer of complexity to the discussion because uh, when we talk about uh, making sure that everyone is represented at the table, there is uh, a topic I find missing in, in feminist discussions, mm -hmm. but maybe it's my ignorance so far, uh, regarding neurodiversity because it's invisible. It's an invisible disability. I don't like to call it disability mm -hmm. because it's a, it's a way how yeah. humans are. Um, and I, I would like to pick your brain on that, um, how, how the state of the art is around the new diversity and uh, um, how to maybe manage more discussion about it in a political context. Uh, maybe to give a bit more background what, what I'm coming from in the context of um, it's not only the patriarchal structure in which we are living, um, the patriarchal structure um, put everything to normalize, to simplify. Mm -hmm. And now we are kind of in this age where we 
put everything in many different shades, so we add more and more complexity, and that, of course, is against of being productive and very fast, because then we don't only have to discuss about what kind of women or a different mm -hmm. color is on the table, we also have to discuss, also in the male sector, uh, mm -hmm what are the different ways of thinking about problems, because that would also solve many issues from a different point of angle mm -hmm. that we, we don't see or don't know how to address. But what is your uh, answer, uh, your uh, question? Well, my question is, uh, if that discussion is on the table and how to nurture it, because it's a very uh, invisible, um, invisible feature. To, to get more diversity at the table. Diversity on a, on a level of um, thinking and opinion, not mm -hmm. uh, necessarily uh -huh. by culture or by the country I'm born in or mm -hmm. my sexual preference or my gender, but by the way my brain functions. Mm, yeah, okay. Um, I think uh, it's, that's more about silo thinking, um, what you're asking for. Silo, silo to, to, to work and think in silos. It's also uh, a common problem in, in, in the organigram of organizations, that you are in your silo and not working with the other departments. Um, yeah, I, do, I really don't know how to answer it. Uh, maybe one example, uh, when I was with the foundation last year, uh, Germany has had the G7 lead. Um, and I was approached also for funding for, um, for think tanks uh, who were trying to submit uh, a joint paper uh, to Olaf Scholz and the other uh, G7 uh, countries uh, because the summit was here in Berlin. And uh, at that time, I was talking to, to that think tank. I don't want to name it. And they were, they were saying, yeah, we have nobody from the global south okay in terms of ngos or in terms of other think tanks uh, who were contributing uh, with different topics on security on on climate on digitalization uh, on ukraine war and so on and then I, and i said uh, yeah but you don't have uh, invited humanitarian and developmental aid for instance it's completely out their sphere Mm -hmm. and, and I think that is uh, the interesting part. That was the interesting aha moment for me. Like, ah, okay, again, they are even not aware how much, um, how how much networks, how much knowledge are uh, sitting in this humanitarian and developmental sector in Germany, and how many partners on the ground they have they could invite to this summit here, so that they can speak uh, on behalf of of their own interests. That, that silo thinking. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and if I can just just add to what you just said, I think it's it is so interesting, right? Because I I do work in an industry that, like a lot of places, um, as you said, has this tension between having to be fast and productive and really kind of on the go all the time, and at the same time, there's such a tension with how complex the human beings are and how complex the human mind is. And I think there is, it is something I would like to see in the future. I would like to see from, from my leaders, from leaders everywhere, to kind of take a step back from the idea that we got to be productive, that we got to make more money, that we're going to work towards that and really trying to embrace, again, that slowness that leads us to, to be able to embrace um, and elevate and really just kind of understand others and how others think and how neurodiversity work, for example. Um, and, and indeed, I think is also, I think there, there is a lot of work to do. And of course, I think a lot of organizations might say, well, we've done gender, you know, we have 50%. Okay, we've done ethnicity, we've done this. Oh God, there is another thing. And I think it's obviously a, a horrible way of thinking about this, but I think there is so much work to be done and so, um, and, and just we've got to be able to talk about it and be advocate and keep kind of bringing it up because I think it's not, since a lot of disabilities, again, wrong word, apologies for that, are, are also very invisible, it is so, so hard and I think there needs to be better allyship to really bring, and I know I'm not offering absolutely any concrete solution to you, I just wanted to acknowledge that I think that kind of human complexity is still the step that we got to make.
personally. But yeah. Um, I wonder, oh, I see one and two and three. <laughs> <laughs> Super. Thank you, ma'am. This was a wonderful talk. I have enjoyed a lot. And uh, my question to you is, in what ways uh, can feminist uh, transfer of knowledge is impacting Global South? And in what ways it is actually challenging uh, the traditional power structure when it comes to Afghanistan? Because Afghanistan is a closed society. Uh, a sitting government is, has no legitimacy at all. Uh, and women are restricted women are not allowed to go to universities. So it, is, uh, it has a strong influence uh, on Pakistan as well, yeah. because mm -hmm. we have a porous border with Afghanistan, yeah. which is quite long. Yeah. And uh, as you have mentioned about the Hazara community, because Hazara community uh, has also been an affected community in Pakistan, mm -hmm. along with Afghanistan. So what's your take on this? <laughs> You are asking me a question where uh, the, the, the whole global uh, discourse uh, and policy discussion about uh, Afghanistan is completely paralyzed. Mm -hmm. uh, and unless Afghanistan is not becoming a security threat in the future, I don't think that international uh, community will step in. That is what I think. Okay. I'm, I'm very sorry. Uh, and uh, it, it's really painful for me because I have worked I, I, I have worked so many years also in Afghanistan. And um, regarding uh, the rights, the, the basic human rights uh, of women and girls in Afghanistan, I think we should, as, as women, uh, on social media, in conversations with politicians, uh, with business uh, sector, we should uh, try to, to, to make it a, a topic so that it is not forgotten. Uh, trying to make it in an informal organizing, like uh, many uh, women's organizations in, 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 in different spots of the world are trying uh, to get at the decision-making tables. I think uh, we can keep it up on social media. We can, uh, whoever is doing advocacy work, uh, can make it a topic again, again and again. That is what uh, some of the organizations in Germany are doing because uh, the Germans uh, are part of, of the Doha conversations with, with Taliban. Only one woman was representing all women of Afghanistan. It was a big criticism. Uh, it was a privileged woman uh, on top. And uh, I think we should pressurizing, we should continue pressurizing that they, um, that they sanction Afghanistan with the humanitarian aid, with, with all the money which is flooding into the country in the, in the hand of the Taliban. Uh, I know that there is also a divide in, in this uh, discussion. Should, should we sanction, uh, should we call for, for financial sanctions because it will hit the most marginalized people? Or shouldn't we do it? I think there is no other means now to do it. Even humanitarian female workers are not allowed anymore. And um, if you have such a gender segregated society, who will uh, go to the women and give them what they need on a daily basis? When, when if it's not a woman? And what is the role of responsibility to protect in this case? Because yeah. Has to play a significant role yeah, they have, uh, true. in countries like Afghanistan. So international community cannot be uh, isolated or uh, cannot stand aloof from such like developments mm -hmm. because there's great human rights violation against women, mm -hmm. and they are not allowed, and they are facing many multiple problems mm -hmm. in so many different ways, and uh, Taliban's are the same. They are the ones who are the actually perpetrators of violence and uh, they are carrying or executing the same activities. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, right from the beginning uh, when, when the talks in, on Petersburg in Bonn started uh, with former warlords and, and uh, the intervention countries. Uh, it was right at the beginning uh, that uh, very uh, heavy mistakes were made by choosing uh, those people in power sitting at the decision-making table for a new Afghanistan. And that is part of the problem which we see now. And uh, yeah, we can, we can say that, but what about women and girls? What about uh, very poor people uh, in Afghanistan? Uh, we have to pressurize and uh, try to, to get the UN Security Council to, uh, to uh, make a resolution and 
to, to, to implement uh, via their own UN ag agencies, which are in the country. Mm -hmm. I'm you. sorry, I have no, not an answer. I know I have not an answer. It's, it, it, it is such a disappointing, uh, a shaming um, um, thing what happened to Afghanistan and also to women life freedom. To, yeah, you, you see, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. And so we have to raise our voices, at least. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I see there were a couple of questions from the back, and also, and also, yeah, exactly. You're. Okay. Um, thank you so much for uh, the talk. It was really a great one. And I'm really amazed by how you were able to get yourself involved, despite the fact that you came from Turkey and then you moved up the ladder. I was brought up here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's really yeah. nice and I, I am really inspired. But my question is, how, what has been your greatest um, strength so far? And mm -hmm. how have you been able to like, get yourself mm -hmm. to this stage? Mm -hmm. <laughs> my greatest strength. I think my greatest strength is that I'm stubborn. Uh, I'm a difficult woman. In terms of, uh, uh, I want to have power, because I know myself and I would, and I know what I would do with this power. So um, we have many uh, weird discussions in Germany of uh, about is it okay to have power? I say yes. We need that power. We need also that political power to change things, and we should really make uh, our elbows more edgy um, and try to help other uh, women, um, regardless of, of where they're coming from, or maybe regardful of where, where they are coming from, and to open the doors for, for them. That is, uh, I, I think my greatest strength is also that, and uh, people call me all, also um, polarizing, yes. I'm polarizing because I have my own values and uh, I want these um, values in terms of human rights, universal uh, human rights, I want to be seen that they lived up. And uh, I'm also taking strong opposition of, of those people who are violating rights of other people. Mm -hmm. So and I'm not this harmonic type of person who is saying, yes, yes, uh, but uh, we have to consider this and we have to consider that. No, we have to consider mm -hmm. that we have um, a very... We have a valid, very valid rule of law system, really, also at a multilateral level. Yeah. And uh, we know that, that the far right, they have two aims. The far right, one aim is to have a one-party country, that you only have one party. And the second is to melt down checks and balances of the rule of law system. Even if these uh, rule of laws, human rights, are not lived up, to, to a satisfying level for us in our eyes. We have really tried to, to embrace them, to save them and to defend them every day. That is what I really think. Yeah, yeah. and just, just to comment on what you just said, that every single adjective that you use to describe yourself are also <laughs> adjective. No, this is a, it was a wonderful answer, but I also think it goes back to no one is telling men to not want power. No one is telling men to not be stubborn. And I think it's such a, such a gendered way of looking at things where we are talking to myself, you know, I come from yeah. a very small village in Italy, everyone telling me that you gotta be a woman or a girl, meaning you gotta be, again, appeasing to everyone yeah. and considerate and all of that. Yeah. And I think the way I was brought up, that was those adjectives you used, they were never a positive thing to describe myself, but I do agree that they are, and that's kind of reclaiming back the mm -hmm. idea of like, sure, I want that power because I know what I would do with that yeah. and because I would lift up yeah. other people. And I think it's really, I thought it was a great choice of words. That's what I meant. <laughs> I think I saw another question over there. Anybody else? So, yeah, I have a question on your polarizing and, and <laughs> things. So. Other people say so. I don't find myself polarizing. I find myself very clear. <laughs> Yeah, I, I want to ask you something with that respect because um, I have something I'm still thinking about. In my company, we have in research, we have a female network called Women in Research. Um, and in this 
uh, network, we have like small networks of like nine women building, a, it's called learning network, and the idea is that they support each other, that they stay together throughout their career, so also if they leave research, even if they leave the company, they stay together to like peer coaching support and so on. And this is since 10 years it exists, and I think two or three years ago there was a discussion whether we should open it for male talents and male uh, colleagues. And my first reaction, so that was there's a small leadership team and we discussed that, and my first reaction was like a four-year-old. I was like, yeah, that's so us. After a thousand years of discrimination, now we have a thing of our own, and the first thing we say is, oh, the poor man, and now they feel excluded. <laughs> mm. I re so that was my really my first yeah. emotional reaction. And then, of course, we had a lot of discussions, as you said, yeah, but look, if we build up another... Mm -hmm non-exclusive society, that's also maybe not the point. So, and I'm still thinking about it, to be honest, because I get the point completely. Mm -hmm. If the other party doesn't even understand our values or the ideas, then how should anything change? But on the other hand, I still think, yeah, but is it enough trying to convince the others that it's the good way especially when we're talking about the, the cake you mentioned, right? I mean, the cake is getting smaller for others then, so what is your idea on that? <laughs> uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, during my time with Medica Mondial, also uh, in the so-called Global South, uh, uh, we had that discussions as feminists from the West. I'm also feminist from the West with a different identity, okay? Um, let's say a hybrid identity. And uh, we had always these discussions because uh, many uh, women uh, um, in Afghanistan or uh, in, in Liberia, they wanted to, to open their network. They wanted to, to uh, work with the men, also in Kosovo, because uh, they said, yeah, but we have to work on them. Uh, they are the perpetrators and uh, they are holding the power and uh, we have to convince them somehow. And uh, we from the West, we were always, no, 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 keep your safe space <laughs> and uh, have your discussions and make your own strategies and open it up at one point, invite them from time to time, but uh, don't do it on a regular basis. In Afghanistan, uh, we had a rule of law project uh, where in three years we could get out 2,000 women from jail on Zina crime, who were incarcerated on Zina crimes. And uh, we, we had a training um, project. We were training judges and lawyers and so on, uh, how to get them out by a proper process. So it was also on top uh, that we were enforcing a rule of law system by doing these processes. And then uh, we took two men uh, on board uh, in, in the female lawyers group, and uh, right away the dynamics were changing. Mm. Uh, because of the uh, also because of the internalized patriarchal roles, uh, also uh, especially by the women who were uh, by the lawyers uh, who were uh, in it, and uh, also the men, of course, uh, they they try to took, take the uh, took the lead uh, right away, and dy dynamic was changing. Maybe it's not comparable uh, to your si situation, but you can think think maybe of a hybrid thing. If you have an interest to to convey your knowledge and experience to men at BASF in, in your enterprise, then do it, but you can find other formats. That, that would be my suggestion. I would not open it up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe my inner four-year-old is not so wrong. So. <laughs> no, uh, do you know what? I can give you another example because we are talking about intersectionality also. Uh, there, there is always also this um, uh, reproach uh, regarding uh, self-organizing of black people, migrant people here uh, in, in Germany, but also in other countries. And for me, it's uh, important uh, that uh, women or black people or um, um, migrant people or all together have a safe space where they can exchange uh, their painful experiences of uh, not being part of the power. Uh, and find strategies together. For me, these safe spaces are super important uh, um, to, to make our own politics. I'm not saying uh, that we should stay there forever. Uh, I'm just saying uh, be regardful and uh, um, be regardful, yeah, exactly, of, of what you, you are doing with this safe space. Uh, because um, we had that among uh, migrant women, black women, Jewish women, no white women for years in Germany. 
Uh, it was also very difficult because we had also our internalized racisms, anti-Semitisms, and, and so on uh, among us without white women. But if we had invited uh, white German women, the topic would have completely changed. We would not have talked about ourselves and our experiences. We would have defended more ourselves against the racism of white women in this uh, safe space. And I think it's uh, the same is applicable when, when you invite men, then uh, the, the nature and also the topic of discussions will change. And then you don't have uh, the resource anymore to organize and to strengthen yourself in terms of strategies. Mm -hmm. That's what I think, my personal experience. <laughs> I wonder if we got any more questions or comments from the audience before we go. Yeah, of course. Yeah, maybe just yeah. What, what, what's next? What's next for you? Oh, uh, I'm looking for a new position now. And uh, it's interesting, I'm not saying I'm looking for a new job. That's already a difference, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm looking for a new position. I don't know. Um, where it will be, I'm, I could work multilaterally. Uh, I could work uh, as somebody who can lead a very big tanker uh, in, in the area of um, human rights uh, or in, in peace and uh, conflict. I, I don't know. It's really super open at the moment. I'm mid-50 now and I have seen so much and not so much Thing, so many things are um, I'm not enthusiastic about anymore because I've, I've gained so much experience uh, and I see so many disappointing things also. And now I'm at a point to think about how to use my life energy yeah. um, for the sake of, of um, a just transformation, which we all need. And uh, in the last year before I was leaving uh, my um, foundation, uh, ah, another strategy for you. <laughs> another, my strategy is uh, uh, when I know that I'm leaving a position, uh, I'm trying to prepare myself for an advanced training. I'm, I'm uh, inscribing myself. I inscribe myself for, for uh, becoming a business coach. And uh, so in that time, uh, it was an uplifting experience to learn something new, to learn new techniques, mm -hmm. to learn more about my own personality. Uh, and to help other people uh, advancing with this technique. I really love coaching now. I have become a coach and I love uh, to coach others who want uh, to, to make the world a better place. I, I, I'm really enthusiastic about uh, these techniques. Uh, I found them very powerful and uh, influencing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the str strategy behind was uh, really uh, if you have a, a gap in your um, going from one uh, and you don't know. So we are all some, somewhere in our lives, we are all somehow lost. We don't know the right direction. Uh, we need really orientation. And then I would strongly recommend before this point comes, try to find something which you're enthusiastic about, which want maybe also apart from your professional life, something you wanted to paint or you wanted to learn a special dance or another language or to travel, then uh, try to organize that before you fall in that gap. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because you will meet another uh, inspiring people like you, for instance, um, and uh, this will help uh, to shape the next etap. Thank you. And thank you for that question, um, Kiara, because I think it, it leads us to a closing. And I also just want to um, ask if you can spare one more minute to chat about um, your mentoring work, because I think you were telling me that you mm -hmm. do a lot of mentoring and you just mentioned that you do coaching. And I think I just wanted to close with the reflections on that and the importance of having role, role models and uplifting mm -hmm. others, because I think that's kind of, this is the right audience for this kind of, this kind of discussion, really. But would, what would you like to know exactly, Domitsiana? So I was kind of wondering, you know, we talk a lot, of, again, in the industry for sure, we talk a lot about mentoring yeah. and how, and I know uh, we're going to have a session around mentoring in the afternoon. And I kind of wonder, like, have you done mentoring in your career and, or mm -hmm. have you received mentoring? Has that been effective t for you? Mm -hmm. And how do you see that role in shaping yourself professionally? Mm, okay. Okay, when I was socialized professionally, uh, the word mentoring was not existing or maybe only in politics, from men to men, uh, from white men to white men. 
in uh, in suits. <laughs> uh, but no, it was not really existing. Uh, but uh, of of course, in the in the la and at that time, I was informally mentored uh, by my um, female role models uh, in in feminist organizing or also in the feminist organizations I have worked in. That was very powerful because uh, social justice was always uh, in these feminist organizations which I worked in. It, it was a migrant uh, feminist organization and a white feminist organization, and both were uh, very keen on having a just salary scheme, for instance, and uh, or uh, everybody was paid uh, similar mm -hmm. somehow. Very interesting, uh, women with university degree degrees and without university degrees, like me. And I, w I got the same salary like the one who had an, a diploma. Yeah, yeah. It was very interesting. And uh, I wanted to say something else. I, for, uh, I forgot it. Uh, sure. What was it? I think. No, you, you mentoring, Just mentoring, mentoring, yeah. mentoring uh, in the last, when I was secretary general at Amnesty Germany, I got a request uh, by a foundation, by uh, Deutschland Stiftung Integration, by the Christian Democrats. Uh, it's more a business uh, thing, but uh, somebody from conflict uh, studies, uh, also a migrant young woman from Frankfurt, she saw me talking in the Bundestag and she said, this should That's be my mentor. She and was right, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I mentored her for two years uh, during her studies and she went to, um, to Calais to work there half a year. She was before at the Mexican border, then she was in Calais working with the refugees there. And uh, every second week uh, we talked and sometimes she was nearly uh, at the edge of despair mm -hmm. when she was calling me and saying, Sammy, what can I do? It is so, it is so desperate here with, with the people, this context and no support and so on. And I said, why are you not in Brussels before the commission? Why are you hiding there in, in Calais? Take the refugees, take the organizations working there, make some advocacy uh, in Brussels at Place Schumann. And uh, then she said, I mean, I've never done that. Uh, how can we do that? And then my, uh, at that time I was unemployed and my, uh, my Wohnzimmer became some, somehow like an action central. And uh, we were talking every day, every day. And, and I was really, that was more than mentoring. That was more coaching how, how to, how to get there. And she had a lot of male people from organizations mm -hmm. also working in Calais. Uh, who wanted to to, to um, yeah you, who wanted to to have the only say about who is yeah. speaking who where on media uh, there at Place Schumann uh, before the EU Commission and I told her uh, how to shape her elbows <laughs> so that she would be the one who was talking and not the man from the white organization working there and. Uh, <laughs> It was, yeah, that yeah. was very uh, powerful. And uh, I, I can only recommend, uh, you don't have to go uh, via another foundation to found uh, a mentor. I can be a mentor. Everybody here sitting can, you can be mentors. Uh, you, you can even um, uh, share it via social media that you are ready to accompany somebody for one year. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Self-organizing. Or it can come out from here, from the Falling Walls That's Foundation. Right, yeah. Thank you. Well, I think we are out of time, but thank you so, so much again for sharing all of this with us. And thank you for being you know, so, so open, so personal, so honest. I think it really, really makes a difference. Thank Grazie. you again. Grazie. Thank you. Thank you.